Hello and welcome to Altitude. I'm your host, Russell Porter, and today we'll be talking about artificial intelligence. Creating art, writing stories, and sometimes even driving cars, AI is all around us. But what does it mean for the aviation industry? We're joined by three experts to answer that question. Marco Ruckert, Vice President of Technology at Searidge Technologies. Hello, Marco. Hello. Emily Price, Director of Analytics at Nats. Hello, Emily. Hello, Russell. And Ben Carvel, AI Design Lead at Project Bluebird. Hello, Ben. Hi, Russell. Just a quick uh, reminder for those of you watching, we are live, so you can post your questions at any time, so please do so. And I'll do my best to make sure that our panel get to them. Um, but let's start with some introductions. Um, Emily, could we start with you, please? Of course. Um, as Russell said, I'm Emily Price. I'm the Director of Analytics at Nats. And our analytics team essentially convert data and information into recommendations and insight. So that's for customers, <clears throat> excuse me, within that, um, but also for customers around the world. And um, so clearly providing that um, optimised decision making for them, AI can be really useful. So looking forward to talking about that this morning. Thanks, Emily, and welcome to Altitude. Uh, and Marco. Yeah, hi, Russell. Uh, thanks for introducing me. My name is Marco Rueckert. Um, I'm the Vice President of Technology at Sewage Technologies. So my my role it really sees me um, oversee the software development and anything technology that goes into our operational systems and our research and development and innovation systems with our customers worldwide. Focus mostly on digital towers, but we also have some airport systems. Thanks, Marco. And also, thank you for taking the time to join us from across the Atlantic today. Yeah. <laughs> and Ben. Hi, Russell. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ben Carvel. I'm one of the leads on Project Bluebird. Uh, Project Bluebird's a, a really exciting collaboration between Nats and the Alan Turing Institute and Exeter and Cambridge Universities looking at applications of AI for tactical control. Fantastic. Welcome all to Altitude. Um, great set of introductions there and I'm really excited about this episode. It's um, definitely a topic that's in the, in the media at the moment. Um, Marco, could we start with you please and could you tell us a little bit more about sort of Sea Ridge Technologies and, and really what AI means in the context of your business? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Sea Ridge Technologies is a, is a private company. We're, we're headquartered in Ottawa, Canada. Um, we are now 100% owned by Nats, so we are a very happy member of the Nats group. Um, what we mostly do is our, our core technologies for digital tower. So you can imagine digital towers as uh, we install CCTV cameras at strategic locations around aerodromes. We stitch those cameras together and then we will provide either remote control of that aerodrome or we, uh, for larger hub airports, we also provide a hybrid digital tower where we bring video into the tower to enhance the visual line of sight. Um, for air traffic controllers. We also apply that same technology to uh, airport operations. For example, we have some installations in the US where we do um, virtual ramp control using the same technology. Um, so in, in our context, AI really means machine learning. We use machine learning to train different models on the vast amount of data set that we have access to with our customers. Predominantly, we use it in the visual domain so we, we started using that uh, about 2016 with the, the sort of coming up of ImageNet. We started looking at using um, AI to recognize objects, uh, aircraft vehicles in, in images, and then drive some intelligence and improve the visual tracking capabilities of our systems. Fantastic. Thank you, Marco. You mentioned digital towers there. How many around the world are using that type of technology? How many airports? Uh, digital towers overall, um, I, I know we have about 50 customers globally. There are some some other competing companies as well. So I, I would probably guesstimate around 100 uh, installations between POCs and full operational systems. There's, there's probably 100 uh, digital towers around the world. I've also heard about something called Amy. Is Amy a person or a technology? Can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah, so we, we, when we first started with, uh, with AI, we, we wanted to come up with a unified brand for, for anything with AI. I, I mentioned a bit the visual spectrum that we use, so using AI for, for visual analysis, but we also have models that are trained on surveillance data. For example, we have a model that's trained on a uh, year's worth of ASIN GCS data to predict runway exits. We have the same on, on a voice. We actually did a collaboration together with Nats on, on understanding pilot to ad go speech and turning that into text and running NLP on it. So, so Amy is, is actually based on Amelia Earhart when we, when we first started. 
Um, so we are probably trying to humanize AI a, a little bit, but really what we were trying to do is, is create a unified brand for anything AI so that when our customers understand that something is powered by AI in terms of our products, they, they understand that they can expect a certain level of performance and a rigorous um, training that went into the AI. So it's, it's more of a brand than, than trying to humanize the AI. <laughs> I also love the link back to, to a aviation there as well. It's really nice. Um, and what's the long-term ambition then for, for Amy? Yeah, so our long-term amb ambition is, is really we, we are putting more and more AI into more and more products. So we started really with the visual spectrum because we had a product that, that did the visual tracking already. We're now getting really into the surveillance, uh, so optimizing the ground traffic. Uh, we have a product called Traffic Light Automation System where we turn signals for service roads, red or green, to either let vehicles pass or not pass uh, to cross the taxiways of aircraft. So we're, we're trying to combine a lot of the different data domains. So doing that on a visual aspect lets you sort of turn your life, traffic lights on and off as you see it. But if you can then also listen to the RT between the pilot and the ATCO, you can understand clearance is given before the aircraft is actually turning or not turning. So if we're supposed to turn into Taxiway Charlie, but there's a clearance, a last minute change, um, we wouldn't want to turn that, that service road green, uh, sorry, red to impede flow of traffic if we know that the aircraft is actually taking a different route. So it allows us to, to have a bit more of a time horizon on decision and, and really ensure not only safety, which is number one, but we also want to make sure that the big hub airports have an efficiency so they can serve uh, more customers and increase their capacity. So, so the long-term ambition really to summarize is we want to be able to help the aviation industry scale back to you know, even beyond pre-pandemic levels but doing that in a way to allow the human operators to be more efficient and control more traffic and increase the capacity. Thanks, Marco. And as so as Amy's being used, help me out here a little bit then, is Amy learning from the data that is kind of building up in the system? And, and yeah, I guess so are you seeing better better decisions being made, I guess, is the outcome? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So we, we, we have definitely seen that when we train Amy from, from different sites that it is able that, that the AI model is really able to generalize better. So for example, if we started with aircraft only that have the Air Canada livery in, in, in our first POCs in Canada, I injecting some, some different types of aircraft from Emirates, from Lufthansa, really allows the AI to, to generalize more and not only learn the colors of Air Canada, um, so we're really seeing that the, the training data, the more broad it becomes, the more diverse the, data, the training data becomes, the better the AI model becomes. Um, one, one big distinction I want to make sure is that, that the audience understands is we don't have the AI actually learning during the operation. So what, what we do is we, we train the model, we freeze the model, we, we run certain tests of um, performance and we do our safety assurance on that. So we, we want to make sure that um, we don't have a situation where you have the input coming into the model and you can get two different results coming out. So we make sure that the model is frozen. It doesn't learn during the operation uh, because that would be quite a challenge to, to get that to the safety regulator. Thanks, Marco. So talking of uh, complex models, um, Ben, I've been reading about uh, Project Bluebird and its mission to create a digital twin of uh, UK airspace. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Bluebird, please? Yeah, thanks, Russell. Yeah, I, I certainly can. So uh, as I mentioned before, so Bluebird's a big collaboration research project. It's a, a five years in duration. We're currently a couple of years in um, with the partners being Nats as the industry partner and then the Alan Turing Institute up in London being the National Institute for AI and Exeter University, Cambridge University, all working together on this problem of how you might start to apply artificial intelligence to the uh, to the task of tactical air traffic control. So um, in, in, in short, the programme's split into three primary pillars, or we call them themes. So we've got three research themes, uh, the first of which is the construction of the digital twin that you mentioned. So uh, the best way to describe that is it, it's like a, it's a simulator, but it's a simulator that's as close to the real world as we can get. So we take advantage of all our data, embed that within it and try and get a simulator that's as close to the real world as we can. So that's our first theme. The second one is the construction of artificially intelligent agents to then go and control traffic within that simulated environment. So that's the theme two, that's what I'm the lead on. 
And then the final theme is one uh, which I think we'll touch on together uh, quite a bit later, which is all about trust, explainability, and how you start to embed those kind of values in these kind of systems. So we're trying to make sure we've got all the bases covered, essentially. So we've got the simulated environment, the agents within it, and then how we start to embed trust and explainability within them. Thanks, Ben. Um, when you mention a agents there, I can't help but think about the film um, iRobot, which I know is uh, obviously based on a book as well. But, you know, with human like robots working kind of hand in hand with human air traffic controllers, are you building robots? Not quite, although you know, maybe that would help making them a bit more relatable. I don't know, maybe we should look into that. But uh, I, th I think uh, one of the big challenges with this is how you make these uh, systems a bit more understandable and, and, and relatable and able to look into exactly what they're doing. So they're just computer programs at the moment, but we've put a lot of effort into the interfaces which we can understand the processes that they're, you know, the, the things that they're doing, the way that they're controlling traffic in this environment, essentially. So uh, we ran some simulations over the summer and we put a lot of effort into to creating some interfaces that look like essentially what you'd see if you were to walk into operation. So you've got radar screens, you've got strip information displays that tell you about the aircraft that are being controlled. And then you've got other panels that link directly into the agents that we're building that'll tell you what they're up to. So it'll give you a list of the actions they're performing. And you can also go and perhaps interrogate the plans that they're making for aircraft. So that, that's kind of the way we interact them with at the moment. It is through a computer, but we're trying to make it as easy as possible to understand what's happening. And how does the decision making and planning compare to a, to an actual air traffic controller? Then have you done that analysis? Have you have you verified that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, I mentioned the simulations we've run over the summer. That was kind of the key part of that was to start bringing some of that operational expertise into the loop. Um, of this process so that we're not just off doing research in, in isolation. We want to have operational expertise embedded right the way through the program, right? So uh, we ran a human in the loop test. So we were running our, our we had our simulator run up, we had a, a couple of sectors running. And on the one hand, you've got an, an agent controlling one sector alongside a uh, one of our real ACOs controlling the other sector. And then we also had some great help from some of the training section to come and do essentially like a, a, an assessment of the agent as if it was a controller. So we, we're getting that kind of feedback, um, which is really helps with the development. So it, it, it's not just to see how we're doing. Uh, the feedback we get from that gets folded back into the development and informs then how we develop some of these techniques. That sounds absolutely incredible. How have um, the real uh, human controllers reacted to this type of work? How are they, how are they finding it? Well, th they've been essential i think is the is, is the first thing to say you know you really you really can't do this kind of work without that kind of support so we as a project we're incredibly grateful to get the support we did over the summer because it's a busy time but i i think we had quite a few people come through because of the way the watch system works we had a, a lot of different people come in and get involved uh, it was great to see how willing people were to engage with the technology once they sort of understood the motivation behind what we were doing uh, yeah, it was really, they were really helpful, they're really keen to come and give their insights and help us with the development. So uh, yeah, but it, was, it, was, it was gone really well. Nice. Um, you mentioned the Alan Turing Institute, Exeter University, Cambridge University. That's a real powerhouse of knowledge. Um, what's it like or working with those institutions? Oh, it, it, it's just great, definitely. They, they, uh, they, you know, they, these institutions exist to be at the forefront of this kind of technology. That's, you know, that's, their, that, that's their purpose. So if you're looking for the bow wave, they, that, that's, that's where it is. Uh, I think the thing that's been really exciting and that's made it really great to work with them is that there's been a real willingness um, I think from both sides for us to sort of step into each other's worlds. So uh, we're on the industry side, we're trying to learn as much as we can about the um, about the technology and how the, it works on a technical level with them. But they've also stepped into our world a little bit as well. So we've had them in operations. We've had them having familiar sessions with our operational controllers and training. And so it, it's, it's that kind of fusion in the middle. You know, that, that's where the magic happens, I suppose. So, yeah, it's worked really great in that regard. Fantastic. Great stuff, Ben. Um, Emily, it's been it's incredible to hear from Ben about all of the work that's going on in, in Bluebird and the potential that that holds. Um, but I understand that from an analytics perspective at Nats, um, AI is already being used. Um, can you tell us a little bit about a project? I believe it's called Michelangelo. Can you tell me about Michelangelo? Yeah, sure. And interestingly, I think the timings are fairly similar to what Marco was talking about there. So our team first started using and creating AI models back in 2017. Um, it's probably fair to say that to begin with, we would be using that to look at one element of performance at a time. 
Um, when the team then designed um, the project Michelangelo, the tool called Michelangelo in 2019, that was probably the first time that they were starting to bring together multiple aspects of that performance. Um, so if I just describe a little bit about why it came about, um, we were looking to firstly um, be able to um, understand the drivers for air traffic controller workload. Um, so we were collecting workload surveys from our operational air traffic controllers after they'd unplugged from live sessions in our operations rooms and synthesizing synthesizing that with data from our systems. Um, so AI is clearly a really useful tool for, for doing that kind of thing. And not only were we able to predict um, the workload based on um, using that systems data and using those techniques, um, we were also then able to extend it to use that predicted workload to then further um, predict the safety, the environmental aspects and the service elements of what we deliver. So on the regulated side, um, our typical regulated metrics um, revolve around those three things. So it's become a really powerful tool, especially in our portfolio projects that we're bringing in as a business to be able to assess the impact of a single change, whether to airspace or to a system, on all of those aspects at once. So on the regulated metrics, but also on that impact to the human. And so I think that's a really interesting shift within that two year period and to go from looking at one element to looking at all of it together. Yeah, that's a really holistic view, isn't it? So am I right in thinking then that Michelangelo allows you to kind of think about how um, the tech comes together ahead of deployment then or yeah okay and absolutely so it could be six months ahead it could be six years ahead and helping that portfolio team work out you know are their plans sufficient are they necessary we're we potentially going to be over delivering in one area and also the timing what would be optimal as you say and where did the name come from Funnily enough, it's exactly what you described as, Russell, the big picture. So if you're familiar with the painter Michelangelo, he's got some huge paintings. And my understanding from the team at the time is they named it as, as being a big picture, but part of an even bigger picture. So some of those Michelangelo paintings, paintings within themselves, but actually part of a much bigger um, picture on chapel ceilings, for example. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, your team are also involved in the development of the Demand Capacity Balancer. Not such a nice name, but I gather a really <laughs> interesting piece of technology. What, um, what does it do? Tell, tell us a little bit more. Yeah, so it's rather than the regulator side of the business, it operates in the airport's domain. Um, although the name isn't quite as catchy, it does exactly what it what it says on the tin. So it's there to balance the demand for aircraft coming in and out of an airport with the capacity that you have. So the capacity is fairly finite. So how do we help people to balance those two really efficiently? And so if you imagine a, a busy airport, there's so much information, so many things changing in any given day, that's where DCB would come in. And I know I've certainly heard it described as providing predictability when you know that every day is going to be different. And I think when you when you start with that assumption of every day is going to be different, you quickly realise that AI is definitely going to be your friend in that situation. And so again, similar timeframes, you know, the team have put together those algorithms back in 2017. We worked with our partners partners frequenters also gone to develop them further and rolled out that tool initially to Heathrow Airport. So listeners will know that that's a particularly busy airport in the UK. Um, and the fact that those those operational efficiency cell staff are are using that today to help them make those really confident decisions. So it takes in, similar to what Marco said, years worth of historic data. It's trained on that, it learns from that, but you're then matching that with your near real-time data that's coming in. So as you, you know, from anybody that's that's been on a flight, you know that delays can occur from anything from weather to passengers being late to a gate to regulations elsewhere in the network. So the fact it's able to take in all of that information, but turn it into something that that ops efficiency cell staff member can use to make decisions. And so it's ultimately helping them decide, do I need to intervene? How do I smooth what I'm expecting and to see for the day? And it's actually um, allowing them to, to trade off lots of different options at once. So you can have up to, to 10 different um, options. And, and that runs from what's going to happen today out to what's going to happen six months from now. So a really flexible, proactive tool that's crucially helping them get the most of what they what they have in terms of capacity and providing better service to the airlines, you know, 
it's great from a passenger point of view, reducing um, environmental impact, for example, by reducing the delay. Um, and ultimately, batch that predictability. So if those staff are more confident in knowing what's going to happen that day, they won't need to make as many cancellations, for example, just in case. So really powerful tool um, that operates over that really wide time span. Thank you, Emily. And Marco, do you see some of the benefits that Emily's talked about there in some of the applications that you have in with Searidge? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that what, what Emily mentioned, especially about the, the emissions, that, that is one of our goals as well. What, what we're really trying to do is, is make the operation much more predictable. So we try to increase that time window of decisions so that you don't have to go to the conservative approach and say, I'm going to cancel some flights, I'm going to divert to different routes, but I, I build up the confidence into the tool so that I trust the decisions and the recommendations that it, that it made. So for example, we have an installation in the Middle East where we use our traffic light automation system. And we, instead of going fully automated and just letting the human be the supervisor at the beginning, we went to a semi-automated state where the human had to confirm all the recommendations from the AI. So that really let us build up the trust from the users. Um, we, we're coming in and we're installing a system, but it's still the user in the end that, that is responsible for the safe movement of, of aircraft on, on the surface. So it was really essential to bring them along the journey, involve them in workshops early on, make sure the UI, just like Ben mentioned, shows them the under the hood. It can't just be the final decision, but do you see the AI actually making the decision? And is there is there a chance it's making it based on glare on on the uh, the aircraft or not? And if you can look a little bit under the hood, it just gives the user a lot more confidence in the decisions that are made. I'm getting a very clear picture of a very kind of careful stepwise approach to the adoption of AI in aviation. Is that that's consistent? I'm seeing lots of nodding yeah. heads there. Yeah, great stuff. Um, because I've asked about names, uh, Michelangelo and Amy, I think I missed um, asking Ben about where Bluebird comes from. That's a good question. Or is it an unknown? I, 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 I wish I had a, a crap <laughs> story to tell you, but the, the, the answer is, is that we just, uh, being aviation, you naturally lead towards, you know, it, it, it's nice to have birds names for everything. So it, it actually isn't just the project itself, all the little elements in, um, that sit underneath it, they all get their own little bird name as well. So the, uh, you know, the, the sim simulator, um, the simulator package get, is called Starling. And then every time somebody creates a new agent, that'll take a name as well. So our best one at the moment is Falcon because it's, it's yeah it's a good evocative name for, a, for for an agent. But then we've also got a, there's a Magpie agent. There's a Puffin. Any different approach gets another name. So that, that's it really. It's just leaning into the whole yeah, nice things that fly. I love it. I'm glad I asked. Thank you. But sticking with you, Ben. Um, I've been reading some of your quotes and um, you said that artificial intelligence is really what we use when nothing else will work. Can you expand upon that for me? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, it's almost, uh, this is just a slight cautionary thing, really, that, that I think ev everybody here has a belief in the, you know, the power of AI to do some really incredible things. It does come with some caveats, and it's things that are about, I'll, I'll short, ch chuck over to, 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 to uh, Marco shortly on this one, I think would be, would be good, that if you're going to use this technology, then there are caveats to making use of it in the areas of both explainability and in regulation that you just need to be aware of when you're choosing to make use of it. So all that quotes men to say is that if there are other things that can work, if you've got simpler approaches which are going to work just fine, then go use those. It's fine. You know, it's the, that's OK. But if you get to the point where those traditional approaches aren't helping you, then it's worth maybe taking a look at some of these more advanced techniques with the understanding that then you've got that burden of maybe it being a bit more challenging to explain exactly what that model's doing. And also that the regulatory frameworks you then try to fit in with are tend to be less mature, essentially. So that's uh, it's reflected in the way that we're approaching things in Bluebird. So I, I mentioned we've got a little family of agents now all with their own little names. The reason for that is that we're not just looking at the stuff that makes the news. We're also looking at some more traditional approaches as well. So essentially like uh, rules based approaches that you might have seen um, plenty of time ago just to see how far we can get. And naturally, the thing you come up against is issues of scalability, dealing with uncertainty, the kind of thing that we then try to rely on some of these more modern technologies for. But you just need to be certain where you need to use it because it it is a bit of a double edged sword. You, you come up against those issues that I mentioned. So. Yeah, thanks, Ben. In there, you meant, used the word explainability. What about AI is it that you're explaining? I think you touched on it about the actions of the model. Is there more to it? 
Yeah, so it, it was one of the really interesting outcomes from the simulations we ran over the summer is that one of the key criterion for controlling is planning and being able to plan effectively and have a list of uh, essentially being able to say what your plan is for the sector is how you assess a uh, assess a human controller when you're training them you ask what they're planning to do for all the aircraft within the airspace and then hopefully they've got good answer that's a bit more challenging to take out from some of these techniques but it's something that we have put a lot of effort into so as part of the development of the simulation, we added some interface to um, be able to interrogate what the agent's plans are for all the aircraft within the airspace that it's controlling. So, um, yeah, it really helps when you're starting to involve the experts in that decision making process and understanding how the agent's operating. So it's it is quite a key component of a system. I don't, I don't know if Marco or Emily want to jump in on that one because I'm sure you've both got plenty to say. Yeah, sure. And just just on the explainability, I, I think when we first started using AI, it was it was really at the early beginning, and and we really got asked the question right away from regulators as well as this show us what you're training on, explain to us how the decision is made. And at the beginning, we we had no idea. So the the best thing that we could come up with is just start blacking out some of the uh, this part of the training image. So we we learned really quickly that when we started training on aircraft in Canada, funnily enough, it learned that every aircraft was had to be in snow because we were only showing uh, uh, training images with snow. So we ended up actually going into a model where we could black out all of the wings and the tail and it would still say it's a plane. So then we realized that really quickly that it was important to analyze really what is being learned and making sure that you have a diverse training set. So if you bring then our Middle East um, images in there and, and that's sort of, I touched on the diversity of training images, um, bringing in a little bit of a sandy background to really help the model learn the actual aircraft and not the background. Now we're in a sort of second generation AI where we can we can really train only on the aircraft and not the background. But at the early beginnings, it was really important to understand what are you actually training on and what what part of the data is the decision being made on. Yeah, and I was just going to say, we'll sort of completely agree with the points made about explainability right from the outset. That's been a key requirement for our team. And I think like Ben said, you know, that means that you're able to use simpler versions of the models because it gives you that explainability. Um, certainly for, for my team's point of view, we're not providing anything that's, a, you know, a safety critical system that's in live operation. We're providing it as a decision support to that human to be able to turn that massive information into something that gives them that confidence to make a good decision. I'm pleased about I asked about explainability now it felt like a crucial concept hidden in there so thank you all for that and I'm going to cut back to one of your quotes Ben another one I've been trawling them so um, you also said uh, we can learn things in days it might have taken months or even years to do beforehand um, so in hearing that, that kind of made me think, well, it sounds like AI is very useful in the development of systems, but can AI really deal with the complexity of air traffic control if it's left to its own devices? So uh, th this is a great question because it's sometimes quite difficult to articulate what the work looks like in Bluebird. We, we talk about these threads of um, development that are going on, but in terms of where the really difficult stuff is, is exactly what you've just mentioned, right? It, it, it's how do you link up this technology with air traffic control? That's where the trick is. So I, I, I think uh, I'm sure Emily and Marco have had the same experience. It'd be lovely if you could just take something off the shelf and plug it in and it goes and learns how to do everything and you can just sit back. And sometimes I think that's the way it gets portrayed in the media as well, that it's some kind of all powerful entity. You can just hand the task over. It's not quite like that. And however advanced it is, it's always still essentially just a computer program that does what you ask it to do. So it might be able to do some very clever things, but you have to ask the right question fundamentally. That's the that's the trick. So defining what good air traffic control looks like, that is the work of Bluebird, right? So um, by defining that environment properly and posing the question correctly, then you start to see interesting behaviors come out and be developed. But really, it won't learn it all by itself. And that's why we've had such strong involvement with operations because you have to go one step further than the surface level understanding. You need to get right into the core of what it means to do air traffic control, draw those elements out and start to try and find ways to represent them in a way that means we can then start to apply these technologies and see if we can develop effective behaviours. But it, yeah, it's it's really, that's where the trick is. It's not just the technology, it's posing the problem that you've got in a way that you can then link it up and have it learn. So yeah, that, that's the challenge, absolutely. 
Thank you, Ben. Great, great answer. There any, uh, Marco, is that a build I was saw there? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good point Ben made. And I think I, I'd like to touch a little bit on the training data as well, is especially if I can give an example of our voice AI. When, when we when we started looking at translating what the pilot is saying or what the ADCO is saying into into text, we, we thought as well, it's, it's, it's everybody's saying, well, just let's just lose Google, Google's uh, language model, no problem. Uh, let's let's translate that. And, and as soon as we started putting in the voice from from the from the pilot, especially to the ADCO, the first thing that we learned is that the, the signal to noise ratio so it was a lot of grainy transmitting that over over still analog channels it was completely throwing off the model it's it's not the same quality of voice as you talking to your to your google home pod or or anything like that and then we also learned there's a lot of jargon um so it actually took a lot of effort from the operations people as well to translate it into text because i i couldn't even as a programmer i, I couldn't understand all the nuances all the different jargon and putting that then into the training data so it really comes to the point of Although the models exist in academia and, and a lot of the big tech companies are doing a lot of good things, but there is that specific operational context of ATC that there isn't anything off the shelf that you can pick up, even in the visual aspect that it can detect certain types of aircraft. But then when you come into specific settings, we really always have to fine tune and build that rule set of the, the operation on top. So it's, it isn't just a plug and play. Thank you, Marco. Um, I'm getting a real sense of the detail and analysis that's required in order to work with AI and aviation. This is fantastic stuff. It's a great conversation so far. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a few questions now, perhaps from uh, the audience. So the first one I'd like to go with is from Ollie. Um, Oli has written, um, great AI outputs require very good data inputs. I'd be interested to learn what is being done currently to prepare data for these use cases. Who would like to take that one? Yeah, I don't mind that, Russell. Go ahead, Emily. If you're happy for me to talk quite generally, I guess, from, from the beginning on that one. So Perfect. I think we talked earlier, the, the first rule would be, be really clear what it is you're looking to do. So depending on what your question is you're trying to solve, you may you may select different data, for example. Um, we're very lucky in our team that we have great access to high quality data. And Ben, I'm sure he uses lots of, lots of similar data. But what that means is because we're not just using AI for all of our pieces of work, we have those subject matter experts that are using the data, they understand it, they've built up that trust. So actually that kind of gives you that that fast forward when you're using it in some of your AI programs. So I would say if if people don't have those SMEs and reach out to other people, but that's in your business or outside. Um, I think checking also that you're going to have those those inputs when you're actually running your model in real life. So for example, if you're using weather data, you know, don't don't train it to expect data every second if it's only being updated every half an hour, for example. But I think probably the most critical thing when it comes to data is sense checking, validating, does it does it make sense? And does it make sense not just from people who are in that technical space, but those end users that you're ultimately delivering it to? Thank you, Emily. Perfect answer. Um, next question from Jedaya. Um, similar to autonomous driving, simpler environments are usually a lot more achievable for AI agents, i.e. motorways to city driving. Do we see a similar effect in ACM? Great question. I'll, I'll happily jump in on that one if that's all right, Russell. Ahead, so, ben, yeah. It, it's a yeah, it's, it, it's an insightful question, um, definitely. Uh, the as, as you can imagine, uh, trying to bite off the whole of air traffic control in in, in one go is a. Could, could, could be a bit of an intimidating thing. So as we were getting rolling on Bluebird, one of the early things we did was exactly as described. You start with some toy environments, some simplified environments to try and get things working. And indeed, training some of even some of the more exotic machine learning techniques on those simplified environments, you could get quite good behaviors quite quickly. So you just draw some simple geometric say, shapes, have some simple aircraft models. And yeah, because there's no uncertainty embedded in there, because there's no variability in the model, then you can learn to do what looks like on the surface quite good air traffic control. Now, that, that was one of the motivators that then pushed us to go and start using real world data uh, for the sims that we've just run over the summer. So that we had a real big push to try and get towards something that was a bit more representative. And then you start getting into the real meat of the problem, which lives in those uncertainties that you have to deal with in the data. So 
yeah, it, it's absolutely a very relevant um, question to ask. Yeah, you, you have to get the fidelity to a certain level before you're getting feedback that's actually meaningful. And I think that by bring, like Emily said, take advantage of our operational data sources um, and, and, and the pedigree that comes with those. And uh, yeah, you, you can start to get closer to the real world. Thank you, Ben. Um, one for Marco then um, from Toma. Um, what are the biggest obstacles to adopting more AI in the airport environment? Will AI be allowed to continue to learn after deploying or only at the development stage? I yeah, think you touched sure. on this ever so slightly earlier, didn't you? Yeah, for sure. So I, I think I can make another point. Um, so for sure, we freeze the model when it's getting deployed into the operation. Uh, but we do, just like with any other software where we would do a security patch, we do sort of periodically make sure that the operations are running at an acceptable level and we then release model updates. We go through the normal ATM release procedure where we do a regression test, rollout test, reliability test. So it's it's just another software component in that sense, but we do we do continuously make sure that it's performing at the level that ex is acceptable to the operation. And then we continuously improve as we do more research or as more data becomes available, we make sure we roll that out. Um, so, for example, one, one example I can draw on with, together with Nats is we, we had a hold line surveillance system that's actually running in Heathrow right now in a pseudo operational sense. So, so that means it's not actually feeding to the, to the live air traffic control tower cab, but it's, it's running in parallel to the operation and, and almost what Ben was describing sort of in the human in the loop test where we run it in parallel and we show that output and, and make sure that the human can validate um, that that is a correct decision. So we, we train a model to, to understand if an aircraft is um, exiting the runway or continuing on the runway. And we then ran that on, on 50,000 movements at Heathrow to get the data necessary to then make sure that it can go into the, to the operation. And, and I think that is really one of, the, one of the big obstacles as well is that we're still, we're still trying to figure out how to have enough explainability, how to make sure that the regulator is comfortable to put this into operation. So we're still at that point where we need to have the human in the loop. And as Emily mentioned, it's a decision support tool. It's not autonomous and we're not aiming to replace the controller. It's, it's really just allowing them to make decisions on a higher level of information that has been pre-processed by the AI. But even at that point, we, we're still working on the regulatory framework to make sure we can put this live into the tower cap. So we're, we're all working on that together. And there's a lot of good working groups and, and advances being made. But I think that's still my main obstacle is that there is no there's no golden rule how to safety assure this to put it into the tower cab. Thanks, Marcus. So plenty of challenges ahead. You mentioned the human in the loop there, and um, we've got a great question from Josh on that topic. Um, I might uh, might pose it to Ben. So Josh um, has asked, are there certain aspects of air traffic control that require human capability that AI cannot address? For example, emotional intelligence during an incident or accident. I wonder if this is the kind of thing you might have discussed perhaps during uh, sort of Bluebird. Yes, definitely. So it, it, again, an insightful question, really. So the truly human aspects of, of, of air traffic control that um, live in things like command of the RT, I think, is, is, is probably the one that immediately springs to mind when you're making transmissions to aircraft. They need to know that you mean it. And it's amazing how much that sort of human side plays into that, that it, it, it's, it's really a key part of what it means to do control. The one thing I would say is we are trying to look beyond just the core tasks that a controller does in Bluebird. So where there's potential for AI to provide support, we are looking for those use cases. So what that means is not just sticking to business as usual. So we've done some simulations already on avoiding action. For, so when, when, when aircraft get too close together, you've got to step in and be ready with um, clearances to get them apart again, you know, the, sort of the, the really sharp end of safety critical operations. And over the next year, we're looking to bring in some extreme weather modeling as well. So starting to look at unusual circumstances and emergencies, things that happen which are a bit outside the box, which would require, I think our controllers would describe it as more creative thinking and uh, being willing to um, you know, do things you might not usually expect to do in the standard course of operations. And so we're trying to push our agents into those places to see how they react and to try and make it more robust, uh, just so that we understand where the potential in some of this technology lies. But it's a, it's, it's a great question. Yeah, and, and in that, Ben, are you seeing the potential for um, 
uh, the AI to make decisions that the human wasn't expecting. I'm thinking of um, where AI has been used to play games, you know, that um, humans have been playing for, you know, hundreds of years. And then the AI comes along and makes a move that the human player wasn't expecting. Are we seeing that kind of thing playing out? Yes, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, I'd say we're not there yet. You know, we've not revolutionized the world of ATC just yet. I think we're, you know, we're still learning. Um, what I will say, though, is that the work that we're doing with controllers, which is really critical, is finding down what the acceptable constraints are that we can operate within. Because if you were to get three controllers in a room and ask them how they'd solve a particular situation, the chances are that you get more than one solution. In fact, you might get more than three. There's always many ways to cut it. Right. So it's about finding down what are the real constraints we're operating under. And then within that, being creative can be a good thing. But you have to be certain. I mean, the obvious one is safety. We're really, really serious about safety. So until you've got that baseline performance on safety, then it doesn't really matter what you're doing elsewhere. So you set the constraints right. And then within that, you can be creative. But there's certain things we can't do. Thanks, Ben. I feel like it would be remiss not to mention last week's UK AI safety summit that was held at Bletchley Park. Um, it was all over the news and Elon Musk um, had a chat with Rishi Sunak. Um, but whilst the, the summit was going on, the Bletchley Declaration was signed and it said that um, AI presents enormous global opportunities, but it should be developed in a way that is human centric, trustworthy and responsible. So I guess my question for you is how are we ensuring that the development of AI in aviation is uh, human-centric, trustworthy and responsible. Who'd like to take that? Marco, you're smiling, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> sure, I, I can I can certainly talk a little bit about that. And I think that that goes back to the example that I, that I talk, talked about our traffic light automation system, making sure that the human was in the loop as we were doing the, the reliability testing, making sure that they become comfortable with the decisions before they're fully autonomous and they have to deal with a whole new system so I think that that's sort of the human centric, making sure that we, we run those shadow modes and we make sure that the human has a visibility of the decision under the hood. Um, I think that does really the, the human centric part. Um, in, in ensuring safety is, is a really important one. And, and that really comes only through to running it. And, and we still in all of our systems have a big red button that if the controller feels that the decision being made that are in sort of the out outside the box, like, like Ben talked about, there's a weather event, there's certain actors on the on the traffic um, surface traffic that do things that they don't normally do there's still a big red button that says look i'm taking control again i as a supervisor say that there's a human in the loop that needs to step in and make sure that safety is ensured so that safety is always number one and when we make sure that there's that that ability for the human to intervene when they need to thank you linked to that and something that i think you've all touched on is um, aviation regulation, but there's a really good question that's come through from Peter. Um, Peter's touched upon AI regulation, saying that it's been in the news a lot recently. Um, so how does all of that affect or relate to your work? Emily, would you like to take this one? Yeah, I suppose the short answer is, as my team aren't providing safety critical AI tools now, it doesn't affect us yet. However, we are keeping abreast of what is going on and what may develop to make sure that if, even if we're not ahead of it, we're ready for it as much as we can be. I think one other interesting angle for that is, you know, Marco especially talked about the regulatory side. And you can imagine with the pace that AI is developing at, at the moment, the need for your regulators to understand the, the concepts of AI, as well as that safety case in our case that we'd be putting forward, that's potentially going to be quite a crunch in terms of it isn't necessarily a widespread skill set or knowledge base now. So I think that'll be really interesting to see how our respective regulators, not just in aviation, but in all sorts of fields, deal with that. Thanks, Emily. Can I stick with you for a moment? Because um, during the safety summit, when Elon um, met with Rishi, Elon said that uh, um, AI will mean that people no longer need to work. Um, so I'm curious, what's the direction that you're suggesting for AI at Nats in the much longer term? <laughs> so I think that's probably quite a over optimistic view, <laughs> if I'm honest. Um, while a seven day weekend would be great, I, I really don't think that that's probably where we're going to be heading. Um, I think if I think about it within a Nats context, we spoke earlier about, you know, be really clear what you're trying to use AI for. Um, for us, 
we would be saying what are those big challenges the things that are really difficult if not impossible for a human to do let's let's use the ai technology in those spaces so things that as i say are hard they're difficult or they're just mundane and not good use of your time and um, i think that they're, they're quite different scenarios but that's where i would be suggesting we'd be best place to use ai so therefore i guess i'm extrapolating from that and thinking ai isn't going to do every job some of those it I don't think it physically will be you know, stopping somebody from burgling your house or rescuing you from a sinking ship, for example. And some of the things will be culturally unacceptable and we actually wouldn't feel comfortable with AI doing those things. So I think it's great that he's throwing that out there to prompt some thoughts. I, I guess I'm not in the same headspace at the moment. Thanks, Emily. Um, and perhaps, I guess, a challenge that faces AI adoption really broadly um, has been raised in a question from Cheetan. So Cheetan has asked, what are the information security challenges adopting AI in the aviation industry and how do we mitigate them? Uh, Marco, <laughs> let's go with you to start with yeah, that. Sure. So I this is I Sure, I, I can talk to that. Uh, I mean, cybersecurity and information security is, is becoming more and more of a challenge in, in all ATM systems. So we, we used to be say everything is locked away. It's it's in a, in a private network. Nobody can ever touch it uh, unless you have security clearance. That, that's not really true anymore because we're connecting things to the internet. We need to make sure that everything is cybersecurity patched. So the, the overall ATM system thinking is changing, that the system isn't frozen for 10 years. We, we used to produce one, one radar system you know, there's still radar systems from, from the 60s running. That, that isn't the case anymore. We, we need to continuously change. And that, that translates a little bit into the AI as well, where we need to make sure that the AI is, is connected to the systems in a cyber secure way. So we, when we connect it to an operational, so for example, an ATM system that had flight strips, we have to go through a rigorous uh, security risk assessment process like we would with any other system. Um, one thing that is unique to, to AI is, is definitely the, the whole conversation about who owns the, the data that goes in, so the training data. So there's a, there's a whole debate about ChatGPT and, 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 other, and other AI techniques that, that who really owns the training data, who owns the, the model comes out. And that, that's probably going to become a challenge going forward when we, when we talk about airports owning a lot of the data and you know, system providers providing information back to them and, and AI models back to them. So that, that whole part of, of making sure that commercially sensitive data and operational data is safeguarded in a way that can't be extracted out of models and, and given to competitors or, or really leaked on the internet. I, I think that is a bit unique um, to the AI setting when it comes to information security. Thanks, Marco. Um, and changing tack ever so slightly, perhaps for our last question, because I had a feeling that the chat would run away with us. It's such an exciting topic. Um, Eurocontrol have said that artificial intelligence has the potential to tackle the challenge of making aviation uh, more environmentally sustainable. How can it help? Because we've talked a lot about efficiencies, which I guess in turn feeds uh, the sustainability angle. But um, who can help me out with this one? Uh, ben, you, you were looking like you were about to say something there. Let's go with you, Ben. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a really nice one. So uh, I, I, I spoke a little earlier about uh, how we have to try and represent all these objectives for air traffic control in order to effectively train automated approaches. Uh, this is one where I think Nats actually has a lot of pedigree. So out, out of the work that Emily's team, there's significant work done on understanding our environmental performance and what efficiency means, fuel burn, all this kind of thing. And if you have rigorous objectives defined that can describe what good performance looks like, then that's something you can then introduce into a model as one of the objectives. So I'd say representing safety is a real challenge, but we've done a lot of the hard work already in terms of environmental performance, thanks to the work that goes on for um, in, in, in the ops analysis side. So what you have the potential to do if you're building a model that's looking at the, maybe the bigger picture of air traffic control, say for the whole of the UK, by introducing those kind of objectives and seeing how you might control if you were looking at the whole of the UK rather than just one specific sector, then you could maybe come up with tactical actions you can take on a local basis that improve the global performance, right? So this is the thing that's naturally quite hard to do. There's always the, the large scale traffic plan and then there's the precise tactical actions that are taken within a sector. Something to bridge those gaps, that's, uh, that's something that uh, I would say isn't exactly there just yet, but with the application of some of these techniques and applying the right objectives, you could perhaps start to bridge that gap and say, right, well, what actions could I take in a local sense that's going to actually improve that global environmental picture? 
And if I could just build on that, Russell, if that's all right, just because my course, mentioned, yeah. I guess if I'm thinking about it from a past, present and future, in the past, our team had designed that three-dimensional inefficiency metric, um, which we're now regulated on, um, but alongside things like CO2 and fuel burn. We then move to the kind of present where we mentioned the Michelangelo tool earlier, where that is absolutely looking at that trade-off between environmental aspects and those other things like safety that we said are really important. If I look forward to the future, I think, you know, AI can help us identify more opportunities. So looking, as, as Ben said, you know, not just within the UK, not just from an ANSP point of view, but that's exactly one of the things that AI is, is super capable of, is finding things as a human you wouldn't necessarily pick out and trying to do that so that you can all, you know, reach that net zero target, for example, even more quickly than we first thought. Thank you. And thank you all. Um, that is all that we've got time for today. It was a fascinating conversation. Um, it's a really interesting picture that you've painted about AI and the future use of AI as well. So thank you. Massive thanks. Um, I hope you've all enjoyed the show. Um, thank you for posing some great questions. Um, the show will be available on our um, YouTube channel. Um, and please do keep an eye out on our socials for the next episode of Altitude. Um, I think it could be supersonic focused on Concord. Um, so thank you. And and goodbye.